Hey everybody, welcome back to Northern Land. Please abide by the Aftermath like Plus. Uh, I mean, what can I say? We won as the keeper last time. It's uh, early in the morning here by my standards. It looks like we might be as Azel. That's a good morning run. I'm having one of the like I slept pretty well last night. It wasn't like a bad sleep, but I woke up like refreshed. And earlier than usual. You ever had, I mean, I'm sure you've had that happen. This seems like one of those things that's like a universal experience. Like, you ever just wake up like two hours before school? Or two hours before work? Not a common situation necessarily, if you work in the morning. But you know, occasionally, even as a kid, you know, or as a teenager, you just wake up and you're like, Well, it's like 5 a.m. But I'm not tired. And you're, you start doing the math. It's like the opposite of insomnia math. You're like, I could watch like a whole movie, and it still wouldn't quite be time for me to have to leave. That's crazy. It's a good feeling, most of the time, I think. Mind you, that's such bad damage on, on my behalf there. When I was a, you know, a teenager, and it would happen, there wasn't really that much to do. You know, it was a pre... Wi-Fi era, you could, uh, you know, maybe watch TV quietly. You could, uh, you know, if you wanted to go on the internet, you'd have to go into the room with the family computer. And then inevitably one of your parents would get up because you type at 75 decibels and they'd be like, what are you doing awake? And you're like, I just can't sleep. And they're like, well, get off the computer and close your eyes, you weirdo. Is, I'm just saying, as an adult with a cellular telephone, is a much better, uh, is is a easier way to pass the time. Or alternatively, if you got a 16 streak in the Binding of Isaac, and you want to keep it going, maybe a good time to tap into those energy reserves. I think I did. I had like a weird pseudo nightmare last night, and like most nightmares, it made no sense. And it wasn't even- this is a weird nightmare, because I wasn't even in it. I was just an observer, but there were like three dudes in space, and one of the- they, they didn't have helmets on. Must be a Ridley Scott film. <laughs> so they didn't have helmets on. That's a Prometheus joke, it's not that good. Um, both the movie and my joke, ha 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 ha. It's punching up. It made like $110 million. At the box office, it's not even including, you know, airplane royalties. Anyway. Hey! I should have known better, to be honest. Interesting. Very interesting indeed. What was I going to say? Oh, anyway, there was three dudes in space, and one of the, they didn't have helmets on. One of the dudes deliberately sucked out another dude's eyeball with a vacuum cleaner. Again, don't ask me, you know... How does that make sense? You know, was it some kind of super vacuum cleaner? How are you supposed to use a vacuum in space when space is already a vacuum? See, that's a question I hadn't actually considered until it exited my mouth. I don't, to be honest, I don't know how vacuums work. <laughs> vacuum cleaners, I should say. I mean, I'm assuming... HP? Not HP, but it's very valuable. I think we'll just go for the freebies here. Let's take that. That's fine. It's it's not great, but it's okay. Um, I'm assuming that somehow they generate a bunch of negative pressure, which leads to air rushing into them. But now that I think about that, this sounds absurd. Is it just like a is it a, is it a pump? Does it just pump air in really quickly through the? through the nozzle, and then, you know, spit it out elsewhere? That sounds way more logical than... Well, but what is a pump, if not a, you know... something that modifies pressure? You know what? This is a, let's learn something together here. How does a vacuum cleaner work? It uses an electric motor that spins a fan, sucking in air, and pushing it out the other side into a bag or canister to create the negative pressure. I mean... Look. I don't have a degree in engineering. But I lived with, like, six engineers in university. I'm just saying. 
Don't underestimate your boy's ability to occasionally not know the specific mechanism, but at least be generally right, sort of, some of the time. <laughs> I guess. I, I, I'm not cut out to be an engineer. Software engineer? I get it. And that's, again, why, uh, you know, in, in learning programming, I got so stoked because I was like, I bet this is how, uh, you know, people who are, like, naturally good at engineering feel all the time. I think I will buy this as well. And we have Empress, Fool, World. Let's take Empress with us. Um... But, you know, as, as when I was in school, we didn't really do any coding. I don't blame my scholastic environment. We, uh, you know, I kind of grew up in a weird era, you know? Where, like, in kindergarten, people were like, what's a computer? And then, you know, in second grade, they were like, we're going to formally teach you how to type as if that's sensible whatsoever in the modern day and then by like ninth grade they were like what you don't know how to code in uh, QBasic anyway let me out of here so all of our engineering challenges were always uh, they involved physical building and I tell this story now and then but uh, and I think my teacher she designed so many really cool assignments that I totally just uh, like missed out on in seventh and eighth grade because I didn't know what was being asked of me. And now when I go back and think about it, I'm like, man, I really wish I I had an adult perspective. I could have gotten so much out of that. But as a kid, I was just like, I don't really get it. Can't we just do a worksheet or something? But anyway, we had one assignment where a teacher gave us like uh, just a deck of cards and was like, build the tallest structure you possibly can. I know it sounds like busy work, but it's also, you know, it's creative problem solving. You don't have scissors, you don't have glue, um, you know, you don't have any anything but the deck of cards. So what are you going to do? Well, you could just, you know, fold the cards and try to build, um, or you, you don't even have to fold the cards. You could just build a traditional house of cards, or you could fold them, or you could maybe try to, like, rip a slit into each of the cards and then slot them in there to maybe create a foundation to get a little bit stronger. You get the idea. Um, instead, what I did was I spent like half an hour trying to build a house of cards and then with 10 minutes left, uh, it was not working. So I just ripped all of the cards in half because I was like, hey, that's twice as many cards, AKA twice as much height. And I tried to make a big stack of them. Um, and then it, it sort of fell over into like a pile and it ended up being shorter than if you just piled the cards on top of one another, you know, the normal way. So it, relatively embarrassing, to be honest. Um, the thing is, none of these are really that good, but it is kind of comical to double up on them, I guess. I mean, Dead Dove is pretty good. And, you know, Little Harbinger. It's dangerous, but, you know, it's dangerous for the enemy as well. But uh, none of these are that strong. But yeah, I've, I've never had much of a... You know, physics class for me was like, you know, in 5th and 6th grade when they're teaching you about levers and... You know, fulcrums and stuff like that. Pulleys. I was like, I, I don't really get it. I mean, they say that. And then in, you know, 11th and 12th grade, where you spend all day. Yo, that's very good, though. Uh, sitting in a classroom and, uh, you know, doing math. Learning formulas and then, you know, plugging values in to where the variables are. That's where I was like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> I was, as a kid at least, I was always much more of a... I was a theoretical scientist. Even actually in, uh, in university as well. Apparently it's become narcissism out where I talk about myself. But what else are you supposed to do on an Azazel run, you know? It's just like... As long as you have HP, you win. Most of the time. I never really, uh... I didn't like labs that much. Now I'm like, man... That's like the main thing I should have been there for, is learning, uh, you know, what you do in the laboratory. Because I don't have a lab at home. I have the internet at home. I could learn everything I learned in my 
I mean, don't shoot the messenger on this one if you're in college right now, especially undergrad. <laughs> I'm sorry to be the bearer of real news, but I could learn everything I learned in undergrad online for free or for cheap. Now, would I have? Oh, absolutely not, because I would have, you know, some of this stuff is pretty boring. Important to learn if you want to pursue a career in the biological sciences, but boring nonetheless. And, you know, self-teaching, I think, is, is very... is good. As long as you have... I wouldn't even call it the willpower, necessarily, but you know, as long as you have the... You have enough fun with it and enough discipline that, uh... You can stick with things that are not fun to teach yourself. You know what I mean? Programming is, I think, a, a, it's like the classic good example. Everybody likes, hey, uh, you know, import pie game. Here's a sprite that I made for you. Now put it in, and then you type, uh, you know, uh, move position, and then you open the bracket, you put it in X, Y coordinate. And look at that, your little sprite's moving around the screen. It's just that easy. You could be making uh, The Last of Us 2 in six weeks at this pace. That's when the, is it very easy to keep your motivation high from a self-learning standpoint. Where you might need a teacher is when all of a sudden, you know, your boss is like, hey, somebody, the, the last guy who held your position, uh, you know, coded this uh, system for us in a language that you don't know using like an antiquated uh, suite of tools. What I need you to do is go in there and figure out why it's sending in uh, TCP when it should be sending in UDP. We're sending in TCP and wasting, uh, you know, so many bytes per package. Sorry, packet. My mistake. It's been a while. It's been a while. Can you go back and rework this into a UDP-based system? That's where you're like, oh... <laughs> the book with the he head-first Java didn't prepare me for this. Well, I guess head-first Java is not necessarily even self-teaching. I mean, you could use it as a textbook, but you get the idea. You get, you get the idea. You get it. I'm a fan of self-teaching, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying. When somebody tells me they are self-taught, I'm like, I'm really impressed. I don't go, oh, I bet I know more than you just because I've, you know, paid an accredited university 500 bucks per course. But when I see someone that's like, oh, you're, you went to school for programming? That's cool. I'm learning online. I'm like, I'm proud, but I'm also like, talk to me in six months. I want to see where you're at in six months. It's not to be rude. It's just that, I mean, when the, when the going gets tough, sometimes it's nice to have a professor to embarrass you if you do badly, as ridiculous as it sounds, you know? The reason I got good grades in my programming classes over the past couple of years is basically because I apparently, and I didn't realize this until I was an adult, but, you know, deep within me exists uh, an incredible amount of shame. And uh, sometimes I'd be like, eh, I'm busy. You know, I got a good job already in, in terms of both duties and compensation and personal fulfillment, self-actualization. I don't really want to do this assignment. And then in my head, I just imagine you know, the professorial 55-year-old mentor in the class being like, you know, like a... Either getting very angry, like, why didn't you do the assignment? Or, alternatively, just like a single tear rolling down his face and being like, I thought you were... I thought you were different. I thought you actually cared about building a Roman numeral parser where you could pass in a string consisting of valid Roman numeric, numeral characters and then turn it into the actual numeric number that it's supposed to represent. It's not like that. It's not like that, Bob. I just got busy. You know, the new Slay the Spire character came, but it's too late. He's already retired and moved. And, and now he's dead. That's not, I made him up. It's a real assignment, though. Can I, I, I'll hit you with a little programming anecdote, okay? So that, that's a real assignment. Um, basically, the, the algorithm you're supposed to use to determine, you know, 
To, to convert a Roman numeral into a series of, like, its actual number is not that complicated, you know? There's just, there's basically a series of rules that you can kind of, you know, iterate through as you go over the number. You know, like, an X is worth 10. However, an X before a C is not worth 10, it's worth 90, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, it's, you, I'm sure you can design the algorithm, you know, extremely elegantly, or you can kind of brute force it. Um... What somebody in our class did, and they were mocked, and this is probably not the right way to teach, but... <laughs> I mean... I'm, I'm not saying, and I'm being real clear here, I'm not saying I support that, but I will say it was a funny story. Now, when the professor brought it up in front of the class, I was like, you know, you've been doing this for a few years, but it seems a little petty, dude, to make fun of other students in your class. I can't deny that it's funny, though. Um, but one student in the class... Uh, basically wrote an if statement a thousand times that was like, you know, if the variable is I, then return one. You know, and they did that for all Roman numerals from one to a thousand, which wasn't even, like, good enough because, you know, pardon me, I had a little, little coffee burp there. The, uh, the variables, you know, to be tested went up to, like, you know, 5,000 or something like that, but our teacher was like, please don't do that First off like Not to be mean-spirited, but you fail because this is like not the course, but just this little, you know, rinky-dink assignment, but You know secondly, that's just an enormous waste of your own time <laughs> It's like ripping the playing cards in half and then stacking them on top of one another. Which, now that I think back, I'm like, yeah, my 8th grade teacher did make fun of me for that. But I had a sense of humor about it. I was like, yeah, I'm pretty bad. Anyway. That's my only... That's my only funny programming story. Uh, and perhaps the only funny story I have... Uh, the only funny story in history about programming is what I meant to say. It is weird though, like, you might be able to relate to this, it depends on on your, your age and your scholastic experience, you know? But when I was like, I went to university when I was 17, not because I'm smart, but because I have a late birthday. And, uh... Hold on, let's grab this. Please, please stop shooting explosive flies, I'm over it. And, uh, you know, when, when you're 17 and there's a teacher in front of the class, they're the authority, they command the respect in the classroom. When they're like, when you get into the real world, things aren't like that, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, which is, you know, oftentimes true, you know. Although, to be honest with you, I think a lot of the time, this, to be fair, I don't have a lot of, like, relevant work experience. But whenever people are like... You know, in the real world, you can't just, like, hand something in a day late and expect it to be okay. And I'm like, dude, may my experience, people do that all the time. <laughs> people are like, sorry, my kid was sick. And then, you know, even if it's like a relatively, not super serious, but a relatively serious matter. They're like, okay, you know, valid excuse. You know, people have some compassion in real life. I get that school maybe, you know, should be a little bit more... Uh, difficult just because of the fact that you know you you want to instill good habits, but anyway Hold on of space. I think We'll try this um, But as an adult especially you know, I I don't want to talk I I'm one of those youtubers twitch streamers who's like I don't go around telling people like I own my own business I'm an entrepreneur. I'm like people are like, what do you do? And I'm like, ah, you know, I just kind of like turn on the camera and talk <laughs> I'm uh, essentially devoid of any actual concrete skill that would help me in any other industry. But, you know, on a literal level, you know, I've, I've been relatively successful in life. I, I do own and run my own business. I have, you know, contracted employees. Uh, I have to manage, not people so much, but I, you know, I have to be self-directed and manage my own time. Effectively, which like a lot of youtubers are really really bad at streamers seem a little bit better at it Although in like the opposite way they work so much sometimes that they uh, Can't handle their domestic duties which leads to an erosion of their own 
psyche, but you know, that's kind of a bigger and more sensitive topic for a different video. Um, but then, you know, now I, I've had like, you know, some of the professors in computer science, not always the most compassionate people. And, you know, I, they'll sometimes I, I've had a couple of professors who, who just like, you know, in my opinion, didn't have the strongest social skills. And, you know, someone would ask what to me seemed like a very valid question. And they would kind of make fun of them and be like, you know, you can't do that in the real world. And I'm like, brother, you learned how to program in like 1977. And you're teaching at a local college. Shouldn't you be like Bill Gates right now? What do you mean it doesn't work like that in the real world? You, you don't know what it works like in the real world. You've been the tenured professor for 15 years. <laughs> Other people are, I'm not trying to be rude to the, to the professors here, by the way. I'm just saying, you know. What are you, you're gonna, you're gonna tell that, like, uh, I forget this specific example. But I remember, like, there was, like, a little, like, a small argument in one of my classes between, uh, a, a woman that was taking the class and the professor, and it basically, you know, he thought it was a stupid question, but nobody else in the class knew enough to know why it was a stupid question, myself included. And he couldn't explain it very well, so he just started to get dismissive and be like, well, if you do that at, like, a real company, people are just gonna laugh at you. And everybody, you know, we were talking after the class, and we're like, what do you know, dude? <laughs> You've worked at this school for the past 25 years. You don't know what it's like in the real world anymore. You got 19-year-olds making, you know, the greatest websites you've ever seen in your entire life. Anyway, I'm just saying, <laughs> it's when you have a class full of children, it's very easy. And, I, you know... 17, 18, 19, 20. We'll just call them children for the purposes of this, uh, this anecdote here. You know, you could be like, well, that's not what it's like in the real world. And you're like, yes, sir, I understand. Yes, ma'am, I understand. When you're dealing with a classroom full of 30-year-olds who, you know, many of whom already have a degree in a different field and maybe like a decade of work experience in one way, shape, or form, you know, you, you, you get held to a higher standard when you're like, things don't work like that in the real world. You're like, dude, you're five years older than me. You don't know what you're talking about. I get it. I don't have a, a normal perspective on the world either, thanks to my job, but neither do you. So don't give me that. It doesn't work like this in the real world. Everything I know about the real world, I learned from Matchbox 20's magnum opus, Real World. I wish the real world would just stop hassling me. Yeah. Not really. I mean, it's not that much of a hassle most of the time. Anyway. I'm glad we found a bit to carry us through here. And, uh... I know what you're thinking. You're definitely not thinking this, but I'm gonna pretend you are. NL, are you gonna fight Mega Satan? Hmm. It is a good question. I feel like... Mega Satan... Could kill us. Which means... Because we have nine lives, we probably should fight Mega Satan. Because it'll add a little bit of a little bit of interest into the episode. You know what I mean? Right now is a fairly easy cruise. I don't feel bad about it at all. For one, because the commentary has been on point, and we learned a little something about how vacuum cleaners work. So that's uh, that's enough productivity for one day. But then secondarily, I'm also like, you know, we we want to run as the keeper last time. Whether it was easy or not, you know, it took uh, six hours off my life. You know, by m making the old ticker go at 175 BPM. I don't think that does anything for Azazel. I might be wrong, but... I don't think it does anything for Azazel. Anyway. It's gonna be a good week, uh, content-wise. You know, there's, there's weeks where, you know, you start, uh... You know, today's Tuesday, just for the record. Normally, I don't uh, record on Tuesday because we have Team Unity, and, you know, I don't want to blow out my vocal cords, but, I mean, to be honest, I woke up early, as mentioned, and I was like, there's nothing else to do. Uh, Mouth's not streaming, he's got a headache. Nobody else in the community is streaming right now. Bear Taffy's on vacation. 
Dan's playing a Dark Souls rerun. With all due respect, I don't mean to, and it's not actually an insult at all, but I don't, I don't go to Twitch to watch, you know, reruns. I already don't watch YouTube videos. I know it's, it sounds like biting the hand that feeds, but like, in the time that I would be watching YouTube videos, I'm making YouTube videos, you know? I, I don't have a job where I can put something up on the other monitor and watch it while I work. My job is to work to make the stuff that goes on the other monitor while the people who have real jobs work. So I, uh... I don't really watch, like, a lot of... Well, that's not true. I was gonna say I don't watch a lot of mindless content. I do. I just watch it outside of my office on the television. Um... These days. So I figured, you know what? Might as well get a little recording done. Why not? Plus, I get, you know, it's getting into that rainy season the world. in Vancouver. I mean, it's not terrible weather, but, you know, a little bit less outdoorsy time. It's a little bit more indoorsy time. And, you know, one of the things I got to work on, because, you know, it's, it's nice here all year round. But it's only nice to be outside, you know. For like six or seven months, which is still pretty great, especially by Canadian standards. But I gotta work on finding more indoor hobbies uh, that are not work. Very guilty of being like, well, I got nothing else to do. Might as well just bust out four or five Isaac episodes. And that's not a bad instinct, but I am also. I'm like, man, I need to, like, I need to take up woodworking or something. Start making... I was watching an episode of The Righteous Gemstones last night, and Dermot Mulroney's character was, like, making his own chair. And I was like, dude, that owns. <laughs> I legitimately found myself being like, I should make my own chairs. I just... This is a huge range downgrade I don't think we can take. I want to be very clear. Abundantly clear. I have no idea how to do any woodworking at all. Um, I can use a miter box, screwdriver, hammer, nails. That's the, I mean, a, a cordless drill. That's the extent of my, of my handyman skills. I brought this up probably like a year ago, maybe two years ago on video. And people were like, you know, the idea you invented where adults can go learn the skills that were not taught to them when they were younger, it actually exists. It's called, um, you know, Maker Lab. And it's like these series of, of workshops, uh, you know, all around the world that you can go to. And they've got access to, you know, not just, uh, you know, lathes and you know, skill saws and drill presses and stuff like that, but also, like, you know, 3D printers, and, you know, you can learn how to... You can learn basic uh, electrician work and stuff like that. And I was like, that's really cool. And then I looked up, like, the cost of <laughs> actually getting, like, a membership to Maker Lab, and I was like, oh, God, no. Are you insane? It's like $500... Well, okay. It was like $300 a month. And I was like, look. <laughs> I do want it. And I understand, especially, you know, in a city where land value is so absurd, I understand why having a location with that much space and that many amenities would be very expensive. But simultaneously, I was like, I don't know if I want to learn how to make a spice rack, you know, $3,600 a year value. You know, I'd, I would much rather just let that money sit in my bank account doing nothing than, than providing any enrichment to my actual life. Help. That's not fair. It would probably only cost 1800 I think it would take me five or six months to learn how to build a spice rack. Have you seen me play any games with, like, 3D manipulation? I feel bad, but, like... You know, I... I'll tell you, and I don't... Again... Anytime I talk about, you know, a dereliction my parents had in raising me, I want to be very clear that I, I had a very comfortable upbringing. If anything, it's like the ultimate first world problem. I'm like, oh, my adolescence was too comfortable. My parents didn't make me work hard enough. 
and as a result, I lack completely unnecessary skills that would be nice to have just for my own self-esteem. Like, my dad is very handy. Um, even now, you know, he's in his mid-50s. Uh, and the, on the weekends, like, he still does home improvement stuff all the time. You know, it's like, hey, what'd you do this weekend, Dad? And he's like, oh, we, you know, ripped out all the hardwood and replaced it. And I was like, wow, is it like, you know, scuffed up? And he's like, nah, I just wanted like a darker wood. He, he's crazy like that. But as a result, you know, sometimes as a kid, he'd be working on a project. And he'd be like, hey, why don't you come over here and like, I'll teach you how to do this. And then, you know, like I screw it up twice and he's like, ah, don't worry about it. <laughs> just go play Mega Man. I'll get it done. Anyway. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. If you did, click the like button. Also, it's a great deal. Of course, subscribe if you want to see more in the future. For now, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. See ya!